Well, hey, it's Brent Adams with Inside Farm Life, back for another week with another episode. Episode six is here, and we have got Jerry Bone, who's the president of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. And I am here at the world famous Opryland Hotel in Nashville, Tennessee, where next week, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association is gonna be holding their annual convention. And you can hear all about that from Jerry Bone on this week's episode of Inside Farm Life. We've got Jesse Allen back with another Market Talk report, and then our buddy, the Hot Rod Farmer, Ray Bohax, has got some more hot tips for you. And then we're taking things back to the country with Randy C. Moore, a great Texas artist. He just got a new cut on Ronnie Millsap's latest album, and he is open for so many greats in the business. Got a great career for himself, and you can hear all about that on episode six of Inside Farm Life. Well, we've got a whole lot going on this week. This week's show is presented by our friends at Agco. And uh, well, I just hope you'll go and check it out. Uh, we got a lot going on as we build through this uh, month going on to the uh, uh, Farm Progress Show coming up at the end of the month. Farm Science Review in Ohio coming up here next month. A lot going on. And so uh, I hope you'll check it all out. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, do it. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, Deezer, Audible, and Odyssey. Well, I'm going to get on out of here. We've got a lot going on, but uh, go check out that podcast. And thank you to everybody who's been liking and sharing and following the content. I hope you go back and listen to past episodes if you hadn't had a chance to do it yet. But thank you, and we'll catch you on the other side. But for now, it's Brent Adams, Inside Farm Life, and here is this week's episode. For a more dependable, durable, and capable tractor, check out the lineup of high-horsepower Massey Ferguson equipment. The 7700 S-Series tractor is loaded with features to increase your comfort and productivity. And if you run a dairy farm, the RB-Series balers are built to handle everything your operation demands. Straightforward, dependable Massey Ferguson equipment. Visit MasseyFerguson.com to find out more. Welcome to Inside Farm Life, your weekly connection to agriculture newsmakers, hot button industry issues, educational features, and the best in true country music. Now, here's your host, Brent Adams. Well, welcome to another episode of Inside Farm Life, presented by Agco and its fine lineup of brands, including Fent and Massey Ferguson. We thank you for giving us some of your time this week. On this episode, National Cattlemen's Beef Association President Jerry Bone stops by to talk about hot topics in the cattle industry and about the organization's upcoming convention in Nashville. We size up the nation's corn and soybean crop in this week's Market Talk report with Jesse Allen and our buddy the Hot Rod Farmer Ray Bohax is talking predictive learning in this week's Bushels and Scents. Then we take things back to the country with Texas singer-songwriter Randy C. Moore. But first, some news. The drought is still a major concern in some parts of the country, and U.S. Ag Secretary Tom Vilsack recently outlined some of the USDA's programs and resources producers can use to mitigate impacts of the drought. USDA Radio's Rod Bain reports. It is part of efforts to mitigate drought impacts to ag producers in the Klamath River Basin of Oregon and California. It's $15 million designed to provide help and assistance to farmers, in essence, being encouraged not to plant. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack earlier this summer telling lawmakers about that specific offering and, in general, USDA programs and resources to assist farmers and ranchers across the country dealing with drought. For instance, NRCS has announced a $40 million effort across the country, which could potentially be used with drought mitigation adaptation strategies and resources that will now be available through EQIP. As well as the risk management agency offering crop insurance flexibilities related to drought circumstances. The secretary is scheduled to both discuss and observe drought and wildfire impacts to West Coast producers this week. It stops at Oregon and California. A broad Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Well, the drought is far from gone, but conditions have improved in some areas, which is certainly welcome news. USDA Radio's Stephanie Ho and USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey tell us more. 
active monsoon rains have brought some relief to the southwest. Even though we've seen surface improvement, visual improvement in the drought situation across the southwest, there are still extremely serious longer-term issues that have not yet improved due to the monsoon rains, even in areas that have received near-record to record July rainfall, such as Tucson, Arizona, seeing its wettest month on record. That was USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey. We still have groundwater shortages and extremely low reservoir levels, as evidenced by the record low levels in the Great Salt Lake, Lake Mead, Lake Powell, along the Colorado River. He says one good monsoon season will not fully alleviate drought conditions. We're going to have to have a string of active seasons, both monsoon and the winter snow accumulation season, to fully eradicate this drought because of the seriousness and the long-term nature of how it has evolved and reached this point. Midwestern crops are also seeing a lack of meaningful rainfall as we head down the home stretch in the growing season. Now, as you move east of the Mississippi, that is not yet a tremendous concern because we had abundant soil moisture when the rains cut off about three weeks ago. So no huge concerns at this point yet if we see rain returning later in August. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey says it's a different story west of the Mississippi. We have suffered through a growing season-long shortage of moisture in places like Minnesota and the Dakotas. And so the fact that we have had little rainfall over the last three weeks is an even bigger concern. And that's reflected in crop conditions for corn and soybeans. For the lower Midwest. We do have some concerns that extend into Iowa, into Kansas, Nebraska, and even parts of Missouri. But the concerns in those four more southern states are less significant than the northern states where drought is more deeply entrenched. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And if you don't already have enough concerns this growing season, something may be bugging the trees on your farm. USDA Radio's Gary Crawford explains. This story resembles that never-ending TV show, America's Most Wanted. We need your help to catch these dangerous fugitives. Insect fugitives from Asia, Asian long-horned beetles. One of the most devastating invasive insects that we could have here in the United States. Because they can kill many varieties of trees. That's Rhonda Santos with the Ag Department's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. She says U.S. trees have no natural defenses to these Asian interlopers, which have been found in only a handful of states so far. And she says early detection has been the key to keeping it that way. You're our best shot at catching these fugitives. So we do need your help. She wants us to check our yards and trees for these beetles. They're big rascals an inch or more in length, jet black, white Dots on their backs, very long antennae. Also check trees for dime-sized holes produced when the adults chew their way out of the trees. Rhonda says these beetles could be literally anywhere in the U.S. To learn more about what to look for, how to report a possible sighting, go online, search AsianLonghornedBeetle.com. Gary Crawford reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And if you think you've spotted an Asian longhorn beetle, you can call a special hotline at 1-866-702-9938. Again, that's one 866 702-9938 or report online at asianlonghornedbeetle.com. And finally this week, the pandemic and other market disruptions appear to mask how trends in farm expenditures impacted producers last year. Rod Bain explains. USDA's annual farm production expenditures report on the surface reflects a rise year over year. With producers in 2020 spending over $366 billion, with a B, dollars for total inputs and services. Yet, as Agriculture Department Chief Economist Seth Meyer points out, It's been such an unusual 18 or more months. Due to the pandemic and other market disruptions that perhaps mask how trends in farm expenditures impacted producers. For many of these expenditures, they almost have a funny U-shape. Prices declined for some of these things in the pandemic as things slowed. And then all of a sudden, in more recent months, we've seen a rise in some of these prices since that point. Meyer says when looking at individual farm expenditure categories. It provides us a good reference point for, say, 2020 on average relative to 2019. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And now, what is your goat saying? (laughs) That is a pretty sweet shirt you got on there. Did you get that from GoatLifeClothing.com? Very humorous and stylish. No, you cannot eat this shirt. I know it looks tasty. GoatLifeClothing.com
Headed to the Farm Progress Show? Stop by the Massey Ferguson and Fent booths to see some exciting new equipment on display. Experience the future of farming with the Fent One Cab. Get up close with Fent's all-new adjustable clearance sprayer, the Fent Rogator 900. And best of all, witness the North American debut of the Fent 300, Massey Ferguson 8S, and 5S tractors. Come say hello to your friends at Massey Ferguson and Fent at the Farm Progress Show, August 31st to September 2nd. Well, next up on Inside Farm Life, our special guest is Jerry Bone, the president of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association and a farmer and cattle feeder from Wichita, Kansas. The NCBA convention is coming up August 8th through 10th in Nashville, and we wanted to talk about that as well as the latest developments in the cattle industry. And Jerry, welcome into Inside Farm Life. Thanks, Brent. Thanks for having me, and uh, welcome to your audience as we discuss what's going on in the cattle industry. Well, Jerry, you've been president since February, and you stepped into the role at a very active and very pivotal time in the history of the cattle industry as the industry continues to navigate ongoing COVID challenges and tries to prepare for the future while tackling issues such as the cattle market transparency, more opportunities for smaller packers, sustainability, and tax issues. First of all, on the COVID front, as you assess this industry from day to day, how has the beef industry rebounded from that initial shock to the supply chain, and what challenges still exist? You know, Brent, it's, it's really disheartening that we've basically been in black swan events for virtually two years. It started with the uh, Holcomb, Kansas plant, uh, Tyson packing plant fire in August of 2019. We just barely get recovered from that, from backing up cattle. And then we get into the uh, coronavirus pandemic where packing plants were only running at about 50% of normal. So during that time, it's estimated that we backed up well over a million head of fed cattle that did not get marketed on time. And so... Uh, Then you come back with uh, a pretty tough winter, winter storms there that shut down some plants for a period of time. Uh, And then you have the JBS uh, cyber attack uh, that's also shut down plants for a period of time. And so it's been one thing after another, uh, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, Placements on feed have begun to decline. Uh, The total cattle herd numbers are also declining. I think like 1.3% decline from uh, 2020 to 2021. So, uh, Things are beginning to look up. Uh, We're still challenged to some degree with getting uh, these packing plants running efficiently uh, because of labor issues. Uh, But it looks like we're going to get a little more back in line with the demand, with the supply of packing plant hooks and the, and the fed cattle supplies certainly as time goes on through the rest of this year and into 2022. Well, just today we learned that Tyson Foods will require all of its employees to be vaccinated, including its frontline workers, by November 1st. Do you believe that other processors will follow suit? Typically what happens when when one company does it, uh, the others follow suit. And so, you know, they've also all uh, raised rates of salary rates in the last few uh, months trying to attract additional labor and to keep the the people that they have uh, employed fully every week. And uh, so uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the other companies don't follow suit here soon. Well, the early disruption of the supply chain was tough on the four largest meat packers, which buy and process about 85% of the beef in the U.S. And it really showed the need for smaller, more nimble regional packers in the marketplace. Do you believe that we'll get to the point over the next few years where there'll be more packers across the country? There is a lot of concern about the bottleneck that we've seen uh, uh, you know, frankly, we got way out of out of uh, whack with uh, uh, the packing plant capacity and the available supply of cattle. Part of that created by what we talked about earlier, the, the COVID crisis. But uh, there is some movement afoot for some additional packing plants to be built. Uh, one in North Platte, Nebraska, one in Council Bluffs, Iowa. Also, the doubling of a plant in Tama, Iowa by National Beef. But also, there's some incentives and some government assistance that uh, is being put in place to encourage some smaller and medium-sized processors to uh, modernize, to possibly get federally inspected so that they can then uh, sell meat across state lines, those kinds of things. And uh, so there's some hope uh, hope in the future, but unfortunately it just takes time. And I think we saw there was a plan in South Dakota, for example, for a small plant to be open or to be built uh, and it was voted out. The, the people in the community did, didn't want it. So there are still hurdles to be uh, overcome as as we begin to try to grow uh, this packing plant capacity. 
Well, last month, President Biden issued an executive order that initiated several federal rulemakings and committed a half a billion dollars to expanding processing capacity in the beef industry. And that order directed the USDA to consider issuing new rules under the Packers and Stockyards Act, making it easier for producers to bring claims. In essence, a producer won't have to prove that an action harms an entire industry, but instead just the individual producer. That order also directed the USDA to develop a plan to increase opportunities for producers to sell their product in fair transparent and competitive markets and that's a big deal because as we've chronicled here in the past major packers are making major profits and the producers aren't necessarily seeing that trickle down to them despite facing increasing costs yes that's correct and i think the 500 billion dollars that they've allocated are designated to to assist the smaller and regional packing plants to expand and to modernize Uh, I know they're going to be seeking input from the industry about how that money should be spent. So we're looking forward to having input on that and assisting uh, processors and members where we can to uh, utilize some of those funds. And uh, unfortunately, those are a long term process. You know, it's not something that's going to happen overnight, but hopefully in the next two to three years, we will see us stay more in balance uh, supply of fed cattle versus packing plant capacity. Well, there have been calls for quite some time now for the Department of Justice to expedite its investigation of the packing sector. What is the feedback that you're hearing on that? And are you confident that the DOJ will really dig into this disparity between live cattle prices and the box beef prices and provide some greater insights in the near future? We have pushed on DOJ to to, uh, expedite that, that investigation. You know, it really started after the Holcomb fire. We had kind of an intermediary report from them, but never anything final. And then the COVID crisis hit. So we've been pushing on them really hard to finish that. I can tell you that I do know several uh, individuals and producers uh, across the country that have been interviewed by DOJ. So I would say they're doing more than giving it just a cursory look. But uh, we're anxiously looking forward to uh, some final results from that. Well, another key order directs the USDA to consider issuing new rules defining the product of the USA label on beef so consumers know exactly where that product is coming from. And that means processed in the U.S. and not just in a U.S.-owned facility elsewhere. And that may seem like a small thing to some consumers, but that's a really big deal to anyone who makes a living raising beef cattle and just wants a level playing field, isn't it? Yes, it does. And that's a a, a process that NCBA got heavily involved in and really initiated that uh, request to use the processed in the USA label rather than the product of the USA. There's nothing wrong with product of the USA, but we do, it's really a truth in labeling law. And what we were finding was that uh, beef that came from other countries could be unboxed and reboxed or could be further processed here in the US and get the product of the USA label put on it. And we also were aware of some products that had a label from uh, imported from another country, but also had product of the USA on it. And so it's really tightening up the labeling law uh, Truth and labeling is what I would call it. And, and then also someone that wants to use pro- product of USA label yet can do that through a process verified program. USDA has several of those already in place and it would give producers and consumers uh, better and more truthful information. Well, and that's one of the key issues right now, isn't it? That there's no real tracking system for what's out there. Yeah, the labeling, the current product of USA label has nothing to do with origin at all. Uh, uh, like I say, it could come in from another country, be unboxed and reboxed and put that label on it. Well, with all that being said, how did the NCBA and its members make sure that the directives in this executive order are more than just lip service and that some action is actually taken on these items? We work closely with USDA, FSIS, AMS and all of these issues. And uh, I would t- tell you that the uh, the new administration, when they came in, we were concerned how much input we would have, but they have reached out to our industry, to NCBA specifically. And so we we have a seat at the table and we will continue to push and follow up to make certain that uh, the government's going to do what they say they're going to do. Well, once again, the waters of the United States has resurfaced and we have the America the Beautiful or 30 by 30. How do you ensure that this current administration's conservation efforts will take into consideration the interests of agricultural producers and respect their private property rights? The waters of the U.S. law, just uh, they just announced this late last week that they're going to revisit that. They're going to revert, revert back to what it was since 1987 and prior to 2015. And then I think what you will see is they have... a. Uh, Uh, announced that they're going to have uh, numerous uh, listening sessions around the country, different regions to seek input. And we've been assured by uh, Director Michael Reagan at EPA that agriculture and cattle particularly will have a seat at the table in helping design what this new waters of U.S. law will look like. 
I'm certain it won't be as onerous as what the Obama administration uh, put together, and I'm certain that it won't be as good as what we would like from what, uh, based on what the Trump administration did. So it's going to be something in between. I'd say this is a two to three to four year process before we really know what how it will actually end up. But we feel confident that we're going to be able to have some input on that. And I know the environment is a big issue, and it certainly has been from the outset of this administration. What is NCBA doing to communicate its message about the environmental stake that its producers have? We're doing several things. Uh, We had a a task force that just recently developed some goals uh, in the sustainability and environment arena that uh, we'll be rolling out at our convention. We're also participants in the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, uh, as well as the World Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. And we are also uh, uh, wanting, we're going to work really hard to change the narrative. You know, agriculture gets beat up a lot about its contribution to the, to the environment, when in actuality, the EPA of the United States says that the beef industry only contributes 2 to 3% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the country. Uh, we're going to talk about the fact that our animal is an upcycler. Uh, 90% of the food that it eats uh, is products that are not uh, available or consumable by people, you know, such as grass, forages, crop residues, waste food products, those kinds of things, uh, and get that message out there and, and let people know that uh, uh, we're contributing to the environment rather than taking away from it. And another fact, too, is that our producers operate close to 900 million acres of land that sequester carbon. And uh, I, it looks like in the future there's going to be possibly a market for carbon sequestration. So, so hopefully some of our producers can use that as an additional income stream as we go forward. Well, tax structure is another key issue I wanted to touch on here just briefly. We had American Farm Bureau Federation President Zippy Duval on here last week, and he expressed concern over proposed tax hikes, including what many people refer to as the death tax. What needs to be done there to ensure that next generation farmers aren't being slapped with such burdensome taxes that it ultimately costs them a farm or ranch that has been in their family for many generations? We're going to work really, really hard uh, with the administration to make certain that the their quest for money to fund all of the uh, uh, stuff that they want to spend money on doesn't come from our producers. Uh, Step up and basis appears to be under consideration. Uh, We're going to protect that because uh, it's important that our producers are able to pass on their ranch land and farmland to the next generation. You know, agriculture is obviously uh, we have a lot of assets, but uh, we rarely have enough cash. And if we have to pay the taxes on the, on the estate tax when, when someone dies and we can't pass it on to the next generation. In fact, some of them have, have had to sell off part of the ranch or farm or in some cases, nearly all of it to satisfy the tax man. And so we're going to work really hard to make certain that these tax provisions that we currently enjoy will continue to be available to our producers and cattlemen as we go forward. Well, another issue that I wanted to touch on just briefly is the flexibility in the hours of service rules for livestock haulers, because this is an issue that just keeps coming back around and we've seen temporary exemption after temporary exemption. And the issue just seems to get kicked down the road. Do you believe we'll ever see a day when this issue will be hammered out once and for all? And there's an acknowledgement that the work being done by livestock haulers isn't the same as work being done by truckers hauling other consumer goods. Well, we're, we're continuing to work on that. Uh, Allison Riviera in our Washington, D.C. office is shepherding that. Uh, uh, we're, we're, we're not going to give up until we get a complete exemption for livestock haulers. You know, less than 1% of the truck accidents that occur across the country are caused by livestock haulers. But it's also, we've got to point out to the Surface Transportation Agency that one size doesn't fit all, that our live animal cannot be uh, standing on a truck for 10 hours while a driver sleeps, or we can't unload it and reload it without harming those animals. And so uh, we continue to push for a a permanent exemption. Uh, There's been a series of temporary ones. I think the current one expires at the end of September. My expectation is they'll extend it again, Uh, but we're not going to give up until we get a permanent exemption. We were successful in getting a 150 mile exemption on the tail end of a haul added to the recent law. So Currently, what can happen, a driver can drive 11 out of the 14 hours uh, plus the 150 mile exemption on the tail end, and then he has to rest for 10 hours. So we're going to continue to work on that. It's a work in progress. And I think eventually there's a good chance we'll get a permanent exemption for livestock, but not yet. 
Well, I tell you what, policy will be among the items discussed as NCBA members convene in Nashville next week for CattleCon 21, the organization's annual convention, August 10th through the 12th at the Gaylord Opryland Resort and Convention Center. More than 9,000 cattlemen and women are expected to attend the show, which will cover 7.7 acres. And that's a big show and a big impact to Nashville. First of all, what can folks expect to see and do when they come to the convention this year? Well, all the policy things that you've already we've already discussed here today are going to be on the table, and certainly other things. Uh, uh, it's also the meeting where our checkoff uh, uh, partners come and uh, they start to look at authorization requests for uh, uh, how checkoff dollars can be invested in the uh, in the next year. So that'll be ongoing. Cattlemen's Beef Board has their annual meeting there. Cattlefax has a really good uh, long-term outlook session there. As you've alluded to, we have a really big trade show coming in. Uh, some of it will be inside. Some of the displays will be outside. Uh, uh, we've got Kix Brooks is going to be kicking off the uh, convention as the keynote speaker. Jason Brown, a former NFL football player turned farmer in South Carolina. Uh, all the produce off of his farm now goes to charities and for people in need. And so he's going to talk about that and the need for people to volunteer and the to you know, work with the people that need assistance in our communities. So we're looking forward to that. And also we're gonna finish up uh, the last night with a Grand Ole Opry show. Uh, I think there's five or six different uh, personalities that will uh, be performing uh, just exclusively for our, uh, our members and our audience uh, at the Opry. So uh, we've got over 5,100 people uh, registered so far and we're expecting a, a large drive-in uh, attendance also. So it should be a really good crowd. and. I think everybody's going to be excited to get out and about again. You know, this convention got postponed from February uh, because of COVID. And uh, uh, right as of today, Nashville is fully open and we're looking forward to having everybody come in and join us. And we should mention that the Cowboys Night at the Opry Thursday, August 12th is open only to convention attendees. And listen to this lineup. Mark Wills, Crystal Gale, Ashley McBride, Ricky Skaggs, and Lauren Elena. So a big time lineup there. And Jerry, I know there are lingering concerns about safety in these large gatherings. What is being done to ensure the safety of attendees? We'll have sanitation stations set up. Uh, we'll have signs asking people to pay attention to, uh, uh, you know, safe distancing. I think Mask will be optional. We're not going to, as, as of now, it's not going to be required, but I'm certain there will be some there who will uh, will be wearing them. Hopefully most of the people that are attending will have been vaccinated also. And so that, that certainly alleviates a lot of the concern also. Well, one of the highlights of the convention will be a state of the industry address on Wednesday, August 11th. As we wrap up our time today here, President Bohm, what does the state of the industry look like from where you sit? I think we've gone through some pretty tough, rough times and certainly, uh, uh, as we look forward here uh, in the next several months, uh, things are beginning to improve. Now, one of the sad side notes is it's very dry and hot across the western part of the country, Minnesota, Dakotas, Montana, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, and through the west. Uh, so we've got that to deal with. But other than that, uh, feeder cattle and calf prices have been surprisingly strong here in these summer auctions. Uh, fed cattle demand uh, and beef demand is record good. You know, export business is outstanding. Domestic demand is outstanding. So uh, what we talked about earlier, trying to get this bottleneck at the packing plants resolved, uh, will certainly go a long way in helping our producers. But uh, the, the, the outlook here for the next couple of years looks to be pretty exciting. And uh, I think it's really noteworthy that beef demand continues to grow, uh, despite the fact that the beef prices are frankly fairly high. Well, the folks who are in the industry but aren't currently NCBA members, why should they become a part of this organization? We work really hard every day uh, running interference, playing defense a lot of the time in Washington, D.C., but you know, we also get some opportunities to play offense. I think this labeling law is an example of that where we can promote things and introduce legislation uh, that will be beneficial to our members. And so uh, we've got a team of people, uh, you know, about 20 people in Washington, D.C. that are working extremely hard every day, uh, minimizing government regulation, uh, making certain that the regulations that do pass are not harmful to our industry. Uh, we have a team in, in Denver, Colorado, uh, that work on the Federation side of uh, administering the beef checkoff, uh, making certain that beef demand grows, that uh, nutrition research, uh, beef safety, all of those things are kept front of mind so that consumers can enjoy a, a really great uh, beef product every day. 
Well, again, CattleCon 21 will be held August 10th through the 12th at the Gaylord Opryland Resort and Convention Center in Nashville, Tennessee. And you can find out more at convention.ncba.org. And President Bone, we want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us here on Inside Farm Life. And we'd love to have you back in the future as we progress on some of these key issues. Thanks, Brent. Thanks for having us. Thank your audience for uh, listening in. Like a championship caliber baseball team, your fungicide has to be tough. And Concept Agritech has the solution many of America's top growers trust. BioAid is an EPA-registered fungicide that delivers an initial contact kill of a wide range of fungal pests and is safe to the user and the environment. To find out more about how BioAid can help you increase your yields and deliver a higher return on investment, visit conceptagritech.com. Concept Agritech, technology where you need it most. Well, next up on Inside Farm Life, in many parts of the country, the harvest season is just around the corner, and that means we're at the point in the year where we're beginning to size up what the U.S. corn and soybean crops look like. And Jesse Allen has some insights on this week's Market Talk report. Jesse. Well, thank you very much, Brent. Another Market Talk update here on Inside Farm Life. And this week, we're focusing on the size of the crop here in the U.S. How big is it going to be or how challenging Is it going to be in parts of, say, in the Western Corn Belt? Well, we're starting to get a lot of different crop tours happening here uh, the next few weeks ahead, or have already happened. A lot of different private estimates are out there. A lot of data sets going to really flood the market and influence the direction of the market trade here the next month or so. Really going to set the tone for the back half of the year. Now, we do have USDA's August WASD report. That's coming up this Thursday. That, of course, is going to be a very key report. Ahead of that, though, getting, again, some of those other estimates, including StoneX releasing their August customer surveys and giving us an update on the national yield, their projections from those surveys for corded soybeans. We talked with Arlen Suderman, chief commodities economist with StoneX. We talked to him about the survey and how they came up with the numbers. Here's what Arlen had to say. Yeah, the numbers are all based on a survey of our customers nationwide here in the United States, um, based on their particular trade territories, what they anticipate the corn and soybean yields to be. It's it's early in the game, particularly for soybeans. August can really make a big difference, but we wanted to be able to get a handle on what the size of the crops are out there. We put that together. We've been doing this survey for 25 years. I have a pretty good handle on how to make the adjustments and, and put the, pull the data together to give some estimates. And bottom line is it showed the national corn yield at 176 points nine bushels per acre, nearly three bushels below USDA, and uh, the national average soybean yield at 50 bushels per acre, nearly a bushel below USDA. If you put those into the balance sheet, it gives a very, very narrow uh, margin for error for corn yet at this point. And with soybeans, we actually have to ration some demand in order to make the balance sheet work for the year ahead if this yield verifies. Again, that's Arlen Suderman of Stone X looking at the August customer surveys from Stone X. And of course, we got that WASDE report coming up from USDA this Thursday. Now, also, the Office of the Chief Economist at the USDA recently tweeted out a link to an internal presentation regarding drought in 11 Western states and the implications it has for agricultural markets. USDA Chief Economist Seth Meyer focuses on short term rather than long term ramifications. He started by pointing to some direct impacts of the drought this growing season. A bad spring wheat crop and a bad Durham crop because of drought. Those tend to go into things like hitting our export markets for white wheat for noodles in Asia or pasta. And so I see, I think we see lots of short run effects. But I think when we talk about a mega drought, I want to get into some of these longer effects as well, too. And even in the short run market dynamics, one of the things I'd show was a larger cow slaughter because the lands in the West simply won't perhaps hold as many cow calf pairs on those pasture. And we have pasture conditions that are both mixed and really terrible. We'll focus right there on the beef cattle herd in the Western Plains. Clearly, there is a forage shortage. Pastures have dried up and hay fields, actually the nation's number one cash crop, have also suffered from dry conditions. There are short and medium run issues that back up into the corn and soybean fields of the Midwest because of this. Even if we were to break out of this drought, there are lingering effects. And I'll go back to the fact that producers of cattle in the West have the choice of either really poor forage conditions and low handling numbers, you know, density for cow-calf pairs, or sending those animals to feed on what is right now very expensive corn and for other animals, soybeans. 
On July 22nd, Meyer said he did not think the current high price of corn and soybeans was exactly a supply issue. Some of it is maybe a little bit smaller corn and bean crops than we might have anticipated. I think it's robust domestic and foreign demand in particular. And when we look at inflation of food products, it really is on those meat animal sides where, again, demand has been really robust. So far, in big aggregates, I would say the drought is not a driver or not the principal driver. But that may vary. Very well changed. When we think about beef prices and beef price impacts going forward, Western drought, cow slaughter, that's meat. Those cows being slaughtered, which may be a little bit of excess cow slaughter today, is a stake in 2024. That's a missing beef steak that won't be there in 2024, possible food inflation, and a feed grain market at stake because that animal won't be in a finishing lot eating corn. And that's where we end up with this potential condition that If we have a problem with cows, those cows need to move to other locations or be slaughtered. And again, this affects our ability to produce beef because of biological lags years out. There are many points to the discussion Seth Meyer had with the employees of USDA as it is related to the drought in the western United States. Certainly one is that it backs up into other parts of the nation. The other is that if it is truly a climate-changing mega drought with a decade-long duration, the economic disruption could be very deep. And that's going to do it for this Inside Farm Life Market Talk update. You can find us online, markettalkag.com, and make sure to find us on your favorite streaming sources and download the weekday episodes of the podcast. From Nashville. I'm Jesse Allen reporting. You can find Jesse's daily market updates at markettalkag.com. Again, that's markettalkag.com. And you can find him by searching Market Talk on Facebook. He also appears on the American Ag Network, and you can hear him host Your Ag Today. Weekday mornings about 6.50 a.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Satellite Radio, Rural Radio Channel 147. Well, next up on Inside Farm Life, did you know your newer vehicle or farm equipment is taking notes on your operational habits? In this week's installment of Bushels and Scents, our buddy the Hot Rod Farmer Ray Bohax tackles the topic of adaptive learning. Welcome to Bushels and Scents from Farm Machinery Digest Radio, heard exclusively on Sirius XM Channel 147 Rural Radio. I am your host, Ray Bohax, the Hot Rod Farmer, and never forget it is not what you make but what you keep that counts. Modern control units found on road vehicles and farm equipment have an adaptive learning logic that is integral to their calibration. This strategy allows within a certain parameter to alter the way the engine runs and the transmission shifts based on the history of operation. It is housed in the keep alive memory of the ECU, which is part of the RAM for random access memory. A capacitor keeps the RAM active if the battery is disconnected for a short time. Then it will need to relearn. Agriculture runs on machinery, profits on reliability. Visit FarmMachineryDigest.com where steel and soil meet. Well, you can check out all of Ray Bohax's great multimedia content at FarmMachineryDigest.com. You can also hear him host Farm Machinery Digest Radio on Sirius XM Satellite Radio, Rural Radio, Channel 147. It airs each Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern and again on Sundays at 6 p.m. Eastern, so I hope you go and give him a listen. Gateway Seed Company was founded in 1997 on a simple principle. It doesn't start with the seed, it starts with the farmer. We pride ourselves in doing all we can to understand our customers' farming operations. We take the time to listen to their concerns, then focus on providing a solution to address their specific needs. Gateway Seed offers seed corn with trait packages from Bayer and soybeans with trait packages from Bayer, Corteva, and BASF. To learn more about how Gateway Seed can boost your yields and increase your return on investment, visit gatewayseed.com. Well, with the business out of the way, now it's time to take things back to the country, where this week's special guest is Texas singer-songwriter Randy C. Moore, whose most recent album, Lufkin, is a real work of art. We can't wait to tell you all about it, as well as his touring plans and about one of his songs that recently landed on an album released by country music icon Ronnie Millsap. And Randy, welcome into Inside Farm Life. It is good to be here and be from Texas and be with you guys right now on Farm Life. Oh, I love it. We have a big following in Texas, and we're glad to have you. And before we get going, I want to kick things off with a song from the album Lufkin. This is Randy Seymour with Daddy, I Want to Go Fishing on Inside Farm Life. A million stars were in the sky 4 a.m. on the 5th of July. We headed out to Toledo Bend. Me and Daddy going fishing again He said we'll be there in an hour or so 
Charlie Rich was on the radio. I said, I hope that we get lucky today. He nodded his head and I heard him say, If the good Lord's willing and the mercury runs, we'll be on the water before the sun. With rods, reels, and spinner baits, we'll cast our troubles out into the lake. Cause life is a whole lot better when the fishing's fine. There's a little bit of heaven at the end of that line. Now we pulled in to Choctaw Camp. He eased that bass boat down the ramp. I held the rope while he parked the truck. I caught myself waking up. He got us out to our honey hole. How it finds it. I never know, I said, all these trees look alike. He said, son, you can trust an old Indian guy. When the good Lord's willing and the mercury runs, we'll be on the water before the sun. With rods, reels, and spinner baits, we'll cast our troubles out into the lake. to Toledo Bend Me and Daddy going fishing Again La 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 Come on, let's go fishing Grab the rods and reels How does it feel? Son, don't you want to go fishing? Daddy, I want to go fishing I love that. Uh, just one magnificent song out of an uh, album of magnificent songs. There. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So to understand your story, we need to go back to your childhood here. I understand you were born in Memphis, Tennessee, and then ended up in Humble, Texas, just outside of Houston, where you started recording at age 15. What was it that drew you to music? Well, uh, to tell you the truth, I'm, I'm a painter. I like to paint pictures and everything, and uh, uh, that was what that was what my passion was, so to speak. And um, I started singing uh, just because it got to be sort of a joke when I was a little kid uh, for my my folks friends they'd come over and so i'd i'd get out and i'd do a louis armstrong impression you know and i'd i'd do uh i'd do a tom jones or an elvis presley impression and they got a kick out of it and i thought well hey there must be something to this so i started just doing it kind of as a silly joke and then uh, the joke got a little serious more serious uh when i started writing songs and i picked up the guitar and started playing it and my my mother she was the, this was her idea. I was in a little band and we were singing together and I came home one day and told her that we were all going to get instruments. And when she asked me what I was going to play, I said the drums and she says, Oh no, you're not. You're going to play the guitar like Elvis Presley. So uh, you see who won that battle. It's okay. Every time I see a drummer show up to a gig, I thank mom for not having to carry all that equipment. <laughs> so, well, kudos, so kudos to you for sticking with it. Yeah, yeah, I did. I, I, it, it just kind of, it, I just, it just kind of worked for me. So I just stayed with it. Um, and the more that I did, the more that I liked it. And so uh, I still paint. I still do that to this day. But uh, started uh, writing songs and and getting serious about it. So 
my folks were behind me, so they they kind of helped me in uh, get into the Houston music scene a little bit because they knew a few people. My dad knew some folks that that knew some musicians who recorded there. So one thing led to another, and then uh, my dad introduced me to a guy he went to high school with uh, by the name of Archie Ancy, who was a big local DJ there in Houston. And, uh, my dad didn't really remember Arch that well, but Arch remembered my dad real well. Cause my dad was an all Memphis, all Tennessee, uh, high school football player. And so he was a big hero in high school to Arch. So Arch was just tickled to death to do something with me. And, and it worked out real good. He helped me, um, get my first couple of records recorded. Uh, I got introduced to some folks in Nashville and made a couple of records. And then he started, he started playing them. So I got some Texas airplay along the way. I'm still 15, 16 years old by this point. So I'm really, I'm having fun with it. You know, it's, it's a big deal. And then Arch starts inviting me out to play his, his regular show that he would have at Gilly's nightclub. So I got to play Gilly's nightclub for about a year or so uh, when I was around 15, 16, a little bit of 17, uh, every Thursday night, I'd get up and I'd do a couple of songs. Arch had introduced me and that kind of helped me kind of figure out how all that worked too, as far as like being on a, a real stage in a real, uh, environment where people were listening and having a good time and stuff. So I liked all of it. So I just kept after it. And one thing led to another and, and, um, I moved to Nashville because I thought, well, the Houston music scene really isn't for me. Uh, I need to go to Nashville because they're making really great records there. And I, I was a big fan of Ronnie Millsap at the time, uh, but I was also a big fan of Willie Nelson, but I couldn't really get into the Texas music scene. I, I didn't have the, uh, I didn't have the, uh, let me see. I was, I was, a I I was kind of a straight lace clean cut guy. I wasn't a doper. I was, I was more of a roper. So I, I, I headed to Nashville where, where I didn't have to, uh, uh, be what uh, you might say uh, live a, a whiskey drinking lurid lifestyle in order to 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 get into the the music business. So I got there and I um, um, I was playing at a an amusement park there and and I got asked to be on the Grand Ole Opry. So I did an Opry performance with Roy Acuff the uh, my, that first summer I was in Nashville. So things were going real good. I, I'm. I stayed in Nashville for quite a long time. And the one thing I can say about Nashville is to anybody who's a musician, especially if you're a songwriter and you want to make records, whether you're going to go there and, and somebody's going to do something for you, or you're going to get something going, which might help your career or maybe even make you into a person who's on a, on a record label or on television. Just remember, if you want to learn how to make great records and learn how to write great songs, Nashville is one of the best places to do it because the, the, the men and the women there who write songs, they craft music amazingly great. It's, it's, it's very, very, um, it's not, it's not complicated and it's not predictable. It's, it's, it's all about, you know, the ones who are really the great ones. It's all about how the thing feels and what it's saying and if it's something a little different and of course the records that you learn how to make there you can learn from the greatest engineers and musicians and producers and uh if you train your ears well enough then you can go off and you can kind of do what i do which is i make my own records and i feel really good about what i make because of my experience in nashville so so that's kind of that's kind of the nashville that's sort of my that's my advertisement for going to Nashville, but uh, it, things were working out good. I joined up, had a, a group that I joined up with. We were called the Knot Brothers, and we started traveling around the world. We went to Saudi Arabia a couple of times and different places like that, the Middle East, um, you know, Europe. Uh, of course, played a lot in the United States, everywhere. And we toured a lot, and it was another one of those things where, um, like many things that people who are in the music industry understand, uh, you talk about deals and you get close to deals and sometimes you even ink the deals, but a lot of times the paper kind of goes away before the work begins to start. So and that happened for the Knott brothers. I, it actually happened for me when I was 16 because um, I got pretty, pretty close to RCA records. They were, they were pretty interested. So I've had so many misses in, in the music industry though. I tell people all the time, I think I've been lucky enough to not be successful that where it didn't ruin it for me, I'm still having fun with it. <laughs> Does that make sense? Absolutely. And the one thing I was curious about, country music has changed dramatically since you first came to Nashville, but the creativity it requires and the process behind it, aside from the technology, is still pretty much the same, isn't it? Well, just one more thing about, about the music industry. Um, 
uh, there's one thing I, that, that people, a lot of times people like me are guilty of this, which I, I've tried to be conscious of it. When you're listening to mu newer music, something that's out right now, you have to understand that um, not only is, is it, is it out there and being promoted because there is a market for it. The reason why there is a market for it is because of what's come prior to it being out there. In other words, what I'm saying is, 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 Nashville isn't like is is like any other form of entertainment or like any other product. It's always influenced by its its demand for the supply, and so people who are they, I've heard them. Oh, well, that's not country. That's not country. And I'm like going, well, you you can't say that because I've heard that. I've been around Nashville enough to have heard that in every decade and in every half a decade, you know, it always happens. And the reason why is because a lot of times the people who are the mainstays or the people who've been listening to music for a while, they hear something new and they immediately, it immediately sounds foreign to them. What they don't understand is the people who are creating that music and the people who are buying that music actually came from the same place because uh, right now, for instance, I'll just give you an example. If you listen to, um, maybe the top 20 records out of Nashville, you're going to hear songs that have the, the grooves and the, and the feels and, and the, the, the cadences in, in the lyric in the lyrical things. They're all influenced by hip hop music. Okay. Right. That means that the guys and the girls who are writing these songs are probably of the age where 10, 15 years ago, they were listening to Jay Z. They were listening to Eminem. They were listening to, they were listening to hip hop music because they were in junior high and high school. That's what they listened to. They liked country music because they were from the country, but they learned how to shape that sound that was in their head to something that's country. And that's why that works. And that's the same audience that they're basically selling it to. They're the same people who went to high school and junior high when those, those pop records were being played. So everything follows that progression. If you're going to say, well, what is country? Okay. Country is basically just a very honest, true thing. It's what it is. You can wrap it up. And uh, I mean, not to, not to coin a phrase, you can package it any way that you can, but if it's not honest and good, then it won't matter. And it's, it's not going to go anywhere and you really can't call it country. So the best country songs have some honesty and feeling in them. And, uh, Okay, so it's got a hip hop beater. It's got a, you know, it's got a this. You know what? It's you got to have some flash in that thing. You know, uh, you know, Hank Williams came to town. He would write these depressing songs, and Fred Rose would sit down and say, "Hank, Hank, we got to put some some vanilla in there, son. You know, we can't have it. It can't all be pepper." He said, "You got to put some vanilla in them songs." So about half of H Hank Williams hits. They don't have Fred Rose's name on it, but Fred Rose actually helped Hank shape those into things that people would listen to yeah. because the first versions of those songs, if you ever heard them, you'd go, my gosh, this guy sounds like he's going to commit suicide right after he gets done with his song. Yeah. So it's the same thing. Got to have some vanilla. That's what people want. It's it, people love that flavor. So that's, that's kind of, um, that's my sermon for, for music and, 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 and why I believe that it, that it, it, it turns over and it does the way it does. So right. I'm saying nothing wrong with it. So, well, it's interesting you bring that up because I just had this conversation with somebody a couple of days ago and uh, they were trying to sell me on the fact that a, a popular rock and roll band of the eighties, which I, I, I won't get into the band name, but they, they tried to sell me on the fact that this band was probably more country than rock and roll. And it, it really got me to thinking, how, how do you define what country is? It's, it's just something that's honest and true, you know, and if people, if, if it hits people where they live, then that's, that's the honest and true thing. And if people are listening to don't stop believing uh, by journey and that hits them where they live, that's more of a country thing. That's not a, believe me, that's not a, that's not something from outer space or something because it happened to be something that was popular on rock radio in the seventies doesn't mean that Jason Aldean's not going to get up and sing it and the, and the audience isn't going to go crazy over it because he's appealing to his listeners. He's saying something that they want to feel. They want to feel something. Music is not, we're not selling lyrics and we're not selling notes. We're selling a feeling is what we sell. 
And however it is that you can convey that feeling to your audience, that's 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 it. That's that's the listen, that's the warhead, that's the missile, that's the fuel, that's the whole, that's the entire weapon. That's it. How you convey that feeling to your audience. That's all it is. So I I I, I believe me, hanging around Nashville for the last, you know, I don't know. 10 years, I hung around a town a lot, you know, I, I experienced and I, I, I saw a lot of things happen. I was going, well, you know, if this is what sells beer and this is what people come here to hear, great. That's it's all good. I, I'm not going to do it because I'm going to do, I'm going to do uh, angel flying too close to the ground by, by Willie Nelson, right. you know, and there'll be, there'll be somebody listening to that too. So there you go. Well, speaking of selling beer, we've been talking for quite a while, so how about we hear one more from Randy Seymour from the album Lufkin. This is I Sold a Lot of Beer on Inside Farm Life. It hasn't been a joy ride, but then again, it ain't been bad at all. My dream of superstardom got to midair and then went into a stall. Rubbing elbows with the famous never quite rubbed off on me. I got a lot of mileage from the things I got to see. No, not much of a joy ride, but that's all right by me. Now the rhinestones and the record deals that led me here have faded all away. It took a while to realize that nothing here can never stay the same. All those legends driving Cadillacs from down on Music Road are now sleeping out in Woodlawn or the Mother Maybell home. Makes me wonder why it took so long to finally let it go. I sold a lot of beer in Nashville and never saved a dime. I'll sell a lot of beer in Texas and I'll have a better time. If the foolish and the fortunate can be the best of friends, I'll be drinking with my buddies in the end. Well, I met her down on Lower Broad and pretty soon she was my only girl. I convinced her in two minutes she was living in a wonderful world. Showed her the finest garages and parking lots in town. It's a miracle of sympathy that kept her hanging round. So I married her on Wednesday in my tiny Texas town. I sold a lot of beer in Nashville and never saved a dime. I'll sell a lot of beer in Texas and I'll have a better time. If the foolish and the fortunate can be the best of friends, I'll be drinking with my buddies in the end. I did all I could do there so I won't be looking back when I am gone. All those wasted days and Broadway nights are just the inspiration for this song. I sold a lot of beer in Nashville and never saved a dime. I sell a lot of beer in Texas and I'll have a better time. If the foolish and the fortunate can be the best of friends, I'll be laughing till I'm crying, shooting pool and cheating cards. Singing songs until the rednecks are all passed out on the bar. It'll be just as it was when I started way back then, drinking with my buddies in the end. Well, you brought up Willie and you brought up Hank Williams. Who who were some of your musical heroes growing up? Um my my first and oddly enough i'll go ahead and name it one of my first records i listened to all the time was credence clearwater's revivals cosmos factory and i think what really appealed to me about that was is there's two songs on there that are like very old songs from sun records one is ubi Doobie that was recorded by um roy orbison and the other one is a a, a very early rca cover of a of an elvis song my baby left me and I just, 
when I heard that rockabilly guitar sound and stuff and the stuff that John Fogarty was doing, it just blew my mind. I thought, what is this? I didn't realize that that had existed like 15 or 20 years prior to him actually recording it. But see, he was influenced by blues and by rockabilly. So, so that really got me into listening to music a lot. So anything I gravitated towards kind of had that guitar thing to it, either an acoustic guitar or an electric guitar. Henceforth, I had to end up playing a guitar. So um, I listened to John Denver when I was a kid. And then when my brother went off to college, he came back home with an album called Shotgun Willie. And that was it for me. I was all in on Texas music and on Willie Nelson. And I couldn't hear enough Willie Nelson songs to save my life because everyone I heard, I just thought were brilliant, you know. So to this day, I cite him as like, you know, one of the best, you know, influences that that I think is out there not just for me, but for anybody who really wants to write songs and wants to do something a little different. You know, he, he did something different and people, you know, people in Nashville, really, they, they kind of turn their back on him for that. They're like, well, no, this is, this is too different. We can't do anything about this. You know, I'll tell you what you talk about Nashville. Uh, you came up through Belmont university, which is uh, one of the premier music business and recording schools in the country, especially for people who are interested in a career in country music. How did you learn of that program and, and how did you know it was for you? Well, these guys in this group I was with, the, they were called the Knot Brothers because we were Knot Brothers. Um, they had they had, were going there. One of, them was, one of them had just graduated and one of them was still going there. So they introduced me to the dean. So I went over there and enrolled and I got into the school and everything. And it was really a good education. And, and once again, it was another part of learning the music industry because uh, Belmont was the very first uh, – uh, college. It was a college at the time. They were the very first college to develop a curriculum uh, geared specifically for recording arts uh, and entertainment. And, um, you know, you could get a degree in that, which was, you know, 40 years ago or 50 years ago was unimaginable. But um, a guy named Cecil Scaife, who was working for uh, Columbia Records at the time, got together with a guy who was a, a musician, a songwriter, and a teacher, and a friend of his. And they sat down because Cecil was really interested in doing something uh, on the educational level there in Nashville. And, and Bob Malloy said, well, you know, we need to develop a, a curriculum here where, where we can draw students in who are musicians who want to who get a degree. And, and Cecil was fascinated by this. So, so they developed this, this whole, they developed the entire curriculum. I mean, it was a trial and error thing, but by the time they got done, you could take a music industry course 101. You could take publishing and copyright. You could take recording arts uh, and you could roll it all into your degree. Basically, you, you would spend your time learning about copyrights and copyright management uh, and copyright law. You would learn about uh, music industry you know, how to conduct yourself in a meeting, you know, all these different points of, of things. You got a lot of seminars. You got a lot of people who came through who were music power brokers who would come in and give seminars and students would get to meet these folks one on one. And it helped them because once they graduated, they could either get internships or they could actually contact these people and say, I met you at Belmont. And it was always a good open door for them. So the, the, it, it created a uh, a vast, a wealth of opportunity uh, that probably wouldn't have happened for younger people trying to get in the music industry because everybody, everybody, when I moved to Nashville, everybody who had record deals was either at the age of 30 or older. There wasn't anybody under the age of 30 who was making hit records, you know? So yeah. this kind of, this sort of opened that door, you know, so to speak, Belmont did. What were some of your biggest takeaways from your time there? I think the biggest takeaway was, was being in Mr. Malloy's class because um, he was, it was almost like a history teacher in a way he would, uh, he had, they had a curriculum, they had a book. There was a book that, that had been written around that time it was called this business of music. And he used that basically as his primer. Uh, but then he would go off, he would go off of it, you know, and he would start telling because he knew so many different stories about artists and about situations and about record labels and about deals and all this kind of stuff. He had a vast knowledge of all this stuff. So I learned so much about him as to basically, what to stay away from, what to probably put my efforts into and what ultimately uh, I needed to figure out, which was what is it that you really want out of this? You know, sure. Everybody wants to be famous. Sure. Everybody wants to be rich. Everybody, but seriously, he said he was basically saying, seriously, 
you you have to find something that you love about this because all those rewards, he said, they don't matter. If you don't love it, they don't matter. And to this day, I tell people, don't get into the music industry unless you love it, because if you don't, you're going to be wasting your time. You're going to be you're going to have your expectations are going to get blown no matter how far you get. You know, there'll always be something that you feel like you should be doing or you haven't done or whatever. Just do it because you love it. If you love it first, all that other stuff will come to you, you know, and 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 I'm. I feel like I'm a, I'm kind of a living example of that, even though I'm, I'm not living in Nashville anymore. I don't have to do anything in Nashville. There's nothing for me to do there, but there's a lot for me to do here in Texas. And most everything that, that I learned to do or, or was able to, to participate in people I performed with on stage, people like Hank Williams Jr. And, and Bruce Springsteen and, and Vince Gill and uh, Shannon Doa and, just all these different people I was able to open shows for and do things with. I learned things from them. You know, I learned things. I'll tell, I'll tell you a real quick story too. I don't know how much time we got. Uh, Barbara Mandrell, you know who Barbara Mandrell is, right? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Barbara Mandrell. Okay. When you're in Nashville and you, and you're in the music industry, the one thing that you, that you should probably try to do is you should probably try to learn how to do everything you can do every job that comes along. That's, that's entertainment related. Well, I learned how to do sound for video. Uh, my brother was a videographer and a filmmaker there in, in Tennessee. And so we landed a gig one day where we were doing a infomercial for Barbara Mandrell's record. She didn't have a deal, but she had backers and they were doing an infomercial. It was going to be a double album. So, you know, the infomercial records that came out, there was a wave of them that happened for a while there. People would buy them, dialing up a 1-800 number or sending money in. So, so here I am, I show up, I'm the sound guy, right? Now, as the sound guy, you have to have an intimate relationship with whoever it is that you're miking up because you're probably going to have to be putting the mic up through their blouse or somewhere on their body somewhere. So I'm, I'm working with this lavalier mic with Barbara Mandrell. Now, at the time, I was playing in a rock and roll band and my hair was purple and I was wearing this weird looking t-shirt and everything. And here I'm in this recording studio where we're setting lighting up and all these guys that are in there, they're all the investor guys. They've all got suits on and ties and everything. And they're really looking at me like, what is this guy doing in here? This guy looks like he crawled out of a garbage can. I'm going to tell you something. I sat there and as I was miking Miss Mandrell up, she looked right at me. She says, can I tell you something? I said, well, sure, sure, ma'am. She says, I think your hair is just so cool looking, man. She says, that is just awesome. She couldn't have given me a million bucks and made me feel better about myself at that point. And it hit me. The people who are great, the people who are great artists, they have a way of making people feel good about themselves. Garth Brooks is a big star these days because he built his reputation and his career on remembering people's names after the show. His meet and greet was probably the best meet and greet that any artist has done in a hundred years. He would remember people's names. They'd go back to a venue. He'd remember their names. He'd remember their kids. Hey, it, you're, he would remember what their kids did. You know, he his his mind is like a, this huge Rolodex. And, and people went, wow, this guy really, he really he cares, you know, he remembers me. That's important to folks, you know, that's really important. So I learned, I learned a valuable lesson like that. that and those are the kind of things that Mr. Malloy would teach, you know, you know, learn to learn to do something that that's going to, if you're going to be an artist, learn to do something that's going to make people feel like that you care and that you're, you, you're wanting to do something for them. You know, anybody can kind of stand in the spotlight and, you know, have, have a lot of adoration poured on them. But if you can pour adoration out equally or, or better than what you're getting, you're really going to go somewhere, you know. And, and, and I found out that any gig I ever do, I'm always looking to find that person that I'm reaching, you know. If, if I'm reaching them, that's that I'm doing my job, you know. So those are the kind of things I learned from, from Mr. Malloy. So uh, there you go. At that time, you were growing as a songwriter. What what did that look like, and how, how did you see yourself evolve? Um, writing songs got to be um, a very bad thing for me for a while because 
uh, when you're in Nashville or when you're in the music industry and you're, you're in a music industry driven uh, environment, you get a lot of voices, a lot of people telling you this, a lot of people telling you that and you hear this and you hear that and you hear that. And you keep thinking, what can I do to make this or what can I do to make that? Well, after a certain point of time, you're either going to get completely frustrated and you go, you know, I don't even know what I'm doing. So I give up. Or you're going to say, you know what? I think I've heard enough. I'm just going to do what I can live with and what I love. And if that's just not good enough for anybody else, then it's still good enough for me. So they tell you, or they don't tell you a lot of times, the best thing that you need to try to do or that you need to pursue is always be true to yourself. Find yourself. If you find yourself and you'll be true to yourself, then what you say and what you do can only be perceived as being honest and true. Uh, if you are making it up because it's cute and all that kind of stuff, you might get somewhere. But more than likely, 10 years from the, that from that moment, you're going to go, I can't stand to listen to that because it's silly, you know? So I try to remain true to that. Let's let me, I, I'm, I'm going to do what, what, what feels right to me. And the reason why I say that is because if you spent as much time in the music industry as someone like I have, then you have learned a lot. You've learned a lot about crafting. You've learned a lot about kind of what works and what doesn't work but you try to let it drive you subconsciously. You try not to be so conscious of it that it sort of messes up your creativity. I tell people all the time, they go, man, how did you write that song? I said, I just got out of the way and let it write itself. <laughs> Cause you know, there's no way I could have come up with that on my own. <laughs> this is almost like being a golfer. Once it starts getting in your head, man, it, it messes with everything, doesn't it? I use that all the time. I tell people all the time. They People say, how is it that you play guitar so well? I don't play as well as I'd like to, but I tell people, look, my buddy Carl Perkins, who is considered one of the greatest guitar players and influences in the world, every, every day that he was at home, he had his guitar in his hand. He had his television in, his, in, their, in their living room. He had a guitar sitting on the stand. He had a Bible sitting on, on, the, on, the, on the nightstand next to his guitar. And he would pick up the guitar. And as he was watching a television program, he would just noodle with his guitar. He just had it in his hands all the time. That way, when it got to be the time where he had to deliver the goods, it was automatic. He didn't have to think about it. Same thing as like a great golfer. You, you know, you can be a good golfer. You can be talented. You don't have to practice that much. But if you're going to be great, you got to you got to hit them practice balls so much that, you know, your hands are in the shape of a golf club, you know. And once you get to that point, it just it just it just works, you know. And you and and I to tell you the truth to this day, I can't tell people I don't know why it works, but I know I've done it enough, and I keep doing it enough to where it just it just kind of flows. So, absolutely. Well, I tell you, you brought up uh, uh, Carl Perkins. Tell us a bit about how he came into your life and, and what that influence meant to you. Well, I had a friend uh, that I was writing songs with, a lady named Dottie Morris. She was writing songs for Gary Morris. And I got introduced to her, and no relation, by the way, but we tell each other that we're brother and sister by choice. And uh, Dottie uh, had been writing songs with Carl. And so we had, and I, didn't, I wasn't aware of this, actually, because we had just written a song together. And she was, she really liked what I was doing. She's, and she asked me point blank, she said, do you think you'd ever like to go down to Jackson, Tennessee and and write songs with, with my friend, Carl Perkins. And I said, how fast can I run to get there, Dottie? She says, well, let me, let me, let me arrange it. So she arranged it. I went down the first time and I met Carl's daughter, Debbie. And so we sat down and we worked on a couple of songs and it re went really well. And she said, well, you have to come back when dad's here. He's on tour right now, but I'll tell you when he's going to be back. So sure enough, I went back when he was there and it was, it was really, um, it was kind of a meeting that was almost uh, otherworldly because first of all, when I first saw him, he was, he was walking towards me. He had a little studio behind his house. He has a swimming pool and then he's got a, he's got a big house, big little shack down there by his pool uh, where he built his recording studio to do his home recording stuff. So he comes walking toward me across the yard and I could have sworn it was my dad. My dad was still alive, but he was dressed like my dad. He carried himself like my dad. And I just thought, I, I'm just, I'm feel like I'm seeing a vision or something here. 
And of course came up to me and I had this really ugly looking beat up guitar that I brought in. And, uh, he kind of laughed at it and just kind of made me feel, feel good about it. You know, he said, well, I'm sure it'll sound all right. And sure enough, we wrote a song that day called blood brothers and, and it was a great little song. And, and we ate, we had catfish later on that evening and we talked and, and we just became really, really fast friends. And, and, um, I spent a couple more times with him and after he'd passed away, Debbie had told me that, that Carl would always ask about me. And I thought he would ask of all the people he would ask, how's Randy doing? When's he going to come back down? You know, you need to stick with that boy. You know, I, she would tell me these things and, and I, I, I'm stunned. I'm absolutely stunned, you know, but the guy, he had, um, he was one of those guys and you've met people like this. I know you've met people like this, especially being around farmers and stuff like that. He could size you up in five minutes. He knew if he liked in five minutes, he knew if he liked you. And if he liked you, he would break his arm off to do something for you. If he didn't, he wasn't mean or anything. He just wouldn't have a whole lot to do with you. He just, he'd be polite, you know, but he, but if you liked you, look out, man, you had a friend for life, you know, and that was Carl. He was a friend, you know, I love the guy. I missed him. I wish he, I wish he was still around because, you know, he could still go out there and do it even up to the day that he died or up to the day he had a stroke. He was still going out there and just killing it. <laughs> you know? He was, he really was, he really was it as far as it goes. So. Well, how about we hear one more from Randy from the album Highway 59 Remastered. This is one simply called Pa on Inside Farm Life. I learned how to fish And I learned how to hunt I learned how to fight And when I should run And I learned how to catch And throw a baseball Then I learned how to lose Cause you can't win them all And I learned there's a time When a man must decide To stop changing and be who he has to be Once and for all yeah, I learned it all, Paul. I learned not to cry without damn good reason. And I learned there were times when you hate your decisions And I learned there's a God Without no religion In the mountains and the woods And the rain on the river And I learned that a man can only be lost if he stops believing in love when the pain gets too strong yeah i learned it all all oh it feels like now this came too late was it god or was it fate I should say all these things to you in this song Years after you have been gone But you taught me all things have their own time and place And I know on some day in your own simple way With one little phrase you'll explain all these things after all I know how to fish 
and I know how to hunt. Paul, my Paul. So this can be a business of highs and lows. How do you keep yourself motivated when you find yourself going through those valleys? Well, um, you know, I find things to do. Uh, like I said, this this past year, uh, when all this stuff slowed down Im- immensely, uh, it, it afforded me the luxury to sit down and really explore some new songs and and really do some things I hadn't been able to do for a while because. Uh, when you're when you are playing live a lot on a weekly basis and you're you're going everywhere, you know, you used up a lot of there's a lot of energy, a lot of that creative energy that would, you know, go into sitting here and, and crafting a song or something coming into your head or hearing a song in your head. It's going into not only just playing the gigs and being out there, but, you know, the preparation for it and then the getting back and decompressing from it. So, you know, there's there's a lot of, there's a lot more, more stuff involved than just kind of showing up, plugging in and, and, uh, you know, doing your thing. There's, there's a whole, so it, it, it takes up a lot more time to do that. So, um, I haven't had a whole lot of, to tell you the truth. I mean, I don't know that there was ever a whole lot of valleys that have ever existed, especially in the last five, six, seven years. Uh, I've been, I've been really fortunate to have been busy and and not be famous at the same time. So, um, which I'm glad, uh, you know, I see these folks who are famous and the ones who are really famous. I mean, you, you they don't really have a life, you know, their, their whole, their whole existence belongs to whatever it is that they do. You know, um, I, I, I kind of doubt that Carrie Underwood can just, you know, take any day off she wants to to take and go out to the lake and go fishing, you know, just ain't going to happen. You know, there's too many people dependent on that, you know, so I'm, I'm fortunate that, that I'm in a position where, uh, I don't mind, you know, when things slow down a little bit, I I like tell you the truth. I I don't, I don't even know why I got into this because I really don't like traveling. (laughs) You can ask my wife every time I'm fixing to go somewhere, she goes, well, I can tell you're fixing to go somewhere. You're not in a very good mood. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things you you did during the COVID period was uh, up and moved from Nashville, Tennessee, back to Texas to to Lufkin. Uh, yep. what, what prompted that? Well, I'd been wanting to move back to Texas for a while, really, ever since before my dad passed away, because he was always talking about going back to Texas. Uh, my folks both loved it here, and. I came back to do a couple of different things and stayed for a week or so. And my wife actually came with me uh, and um, she got Texas crazy and I couldn't believe it. She was, she was going nuts over being here. We went out to the hill country and then went down to Houston uh, around the places where I grew up and everything. And it just all just the whole place just reminded me of so many good things that, that got me started out doing what I love to do, playing music and, and just it just felt like there was more of me here than there was anywhere else in the world. So I made a conscious effort to, to come on back. And, um, it took a while, uh, didn't, you know, it kind of got rocky on the front end, but, uh, then on the back end, it, uh, it just worked out. We, uh, I was researching a place to live because we had fallen out of a couple places we were, we were looking at. And, um, I looked, I looked, I was looking at for, uh, for a place in Nacogdoches, Texas, which is a big college town, uh, SFA is over there and there's a lot to do. So I thought, well, that might, might, might be a good place to go, you know, play music or whatever. So this house that I'm living in now, which is in Lovkin, which is about 30 minutes South of Nacogdoches was the first thing that came up. So I looked at it and I showed it to my wife and I said, you know, these real estate pictures, they always mess you up because they always look bigger in the pictures than they do when you get there. She said, well, I think we need to go check this one out. So we took a whole Sunday, came down here and looked at it with an agent and we couldn't believe it. It looked better than it did in the pictures. And we thought, wow, this is great. So we just ended up buying it and we were living in Nashville. We were still working. But when everything happened like that, we were actually in an apartment. And she looked at me after we closed on this house. She looked at me about a week or so later. and She said, well, I don't know why we're living in two places and not working in either one of them. 
I said, well, can we get out of this apartment? She goes, yeah, we can get out of it. So we got ourselves out of the whole apartment thing and just moved lock, stock and barrel. Two weeks later, two or three weeks later, after she said that, here we were. It was like April. I think it was mid-April when we really got everything finally hit the ground here. But it's been the best thing I've ever done in my life up to this point, um, moving here. And it was real seamless. It was real easy. So the whole thing felt like it was really blessed by God and, and, and felt like felt like that Jesus was in it the whole time. And, and so it worked for me, it worked for her and everybody that, that I know says, man, that's really one of the best things I've ever seen, seen you do. I've seen, a, I've seen a, a bigger change in the positive for you since you've been there. And I said, well, it's, it's pretty easy because I, I love it here. So, so I'm a Texan at heart, you know, and that's a man. It's a killer music scene out there right now. Well, and it and it always will be because, and I'll tell you why. I learned this early on when I was making records and I was down in Houston. Um, I don't know how it is now, but but when country music uh, was being sold in record stores and uh, and and the like, um, the the market share uh, of what was being sold country music wise. Over 70% of it was being sold in Oklahoma and Texas. 70% of, of the profits of country music sales, airplay, uh, record sales, tapes, concerts, the whole thing, over 70% of it was in this region. That's, that's, a big de- that's a big chunk for a business, you know. That's like, that's like saying, you know, over 70% of the, of the toy trains are going to be bought by kids who are eight years old. Well, I'm going to sell it to kids who are eight years old then. So it's a, so Texas has that music thing. It's always had that music thing. It's changed, but it's never seemed to complain about the changes. It just kind of goes with it and says, Hey, yeah, all right, let's do this. That's cool. You know, and good for a place uh, for, for a guy who doesn't like to travel because you can uh, do, do a whole world's worth of shows and not ever leave the state. Yeah, everything's everything's a few hours instead of a day <laughs> away. <laughs> Although there are places that are a day away from here, believe me. Thank You're going to go out to West Texas to El Paso or Sweetwater or Lubbock or something like that. You just better have, just go ahead and carve a day and a night out for it. <laughs> just looking at your schedule, 15 dates in July alone and all those in Texas. And then, uh, you know, you got more coming up here. What's the rest of the year looking like for you? I'm going to be doing a couple of Opry's down in Houston and Pearland uh, and Sugarland uh, and in Alvin, uh, Texas. Those are all in the Houston area. Um, I'm playing in places like uh, uh, Canton and Carthage. I'm playing at Carthage. I'm doing a show at the country music, the Texas Country Music Hall of Fame and, and Tex Ritter Museum. I'm going to be hosting a gospel uh, show there uh, on a Sunday morning with the people like Mo Bandy and, and uh, Linda Davis and folks like that may be singing there. I don't know. It's a, they're, they're there for like three or four days. And then on the Sunday, they do a Sunday gospel show. And so whoever wants to participate in the gospel show. So I don't know who's going to show up. It could, it could be me and this thing right here, or it could be me and everybody. So I'm expecting to have a big time. So I'll be doing that. Um, I'm going down to do a television show in Kima next week, which is down in Galveston area. Um, uh, traveling just pretty much a lot of the Eastern part of the state, central Texas, Eastern Texas, um, getting, getting around Kilgore, um, Waco, just here, there. I mean, it's, it's getting to be a, uh, a, a lot of push pins on the map of Texas. So, and I'm, I'm happy to do it because it's a, uh, I seem to be showing up at the right places and doing the right things. So I'm happy about that. Well, back in January, we talked about this earlier. You, you released your latest album, which was titled Lufkin, after your your town there. Tell us about the project. Well, um, when I got here and um, we got settled in, I was uh, <clears throat> I got my studio set up, and I'd, I had recorded. There was one song I had recorded in Nashville um, that had uh, a track. It was a tracking session I'd done, and um, I thought, well, I need to finish that. Uh, I had already talked to the guy I'd written the song with. It was called Big in Texas is the name of the song. And I wrote it with this guy, David Lee. And we had re- originally written this song 25 years ago, it had a different title, and the chorus was different. But all the verses were exactly the same. And I called him and I said, David, 
I said, I think I have a way to fix this song. He said, well, I didn't know it was broken. I said, yeah, it feels like it is. So I ran the idea by him and he loved it. So I went ahead and finished it up here. And then in the process of finishing that song up, all these other songs started jumping into my head. The song about going fishing, which had been around for a while that jumped in there. And I, and, and I have a thing about, about recording songs. I, it's, I don't like to do them unless it feels like the right time to do them. You know, I, I, some of the songs on Lovekin have been around for a while. Some of them were brand new, but s simply by the, the, the way that I did the record, they all sound like they came out of the same two months worth of work, but they're really, they're really spread out over like a 25 year period. So, so a lot of the songs, a few of the songs on there are, are songs that, that, they just came back to me and I went, this is a good time for this song. And then the other songs were like brand new. And I was like, this is a new idea. This is a new thing. This is what's happening in my head. And I hear everything. And I just, I would just go with it. And, and, and I've got to where that's the thing that works for me best is just going with, with what's personally just coming out of me. Not, not trying to aim the song at something and not trying to um, take some sort of a current, um, event or idea and turn it into some novel uh musical uh performance you know i'm just not good at that some people are great at it i'm not so uh so there you go you mentioned big in texas that's one of the real poignant cuts on, on this album tell us about the inspiration behind that song well i sat we uh, david and i uh sat down in nashville 25 years ago we were writing for a little publishing company there that was run by the guys who were managing john michael montgomery and, you know, of course, most of the guys who were and gals who were writing there, that's who we were wanting to write songs for because John Michael was a big, big deal back then. But uh, this one we wrote and we didn't even know who we wrote it for. We were thinking maybe even the George Strait or something like that, because it did have that kind of feel to it. And so the story of the song really kind of came out a lot of, of David's uh, experiences, his life, uh, so to speak, um, the, the parts about you know, uh, the tree out in the front yard where his daddy used to work on cars and things like that. Well, that's definitely from David because my dad couldn't work on cars at all. My dad was a pilot. He never got under the hood of a car that he didn't have, didn't have to go ahead and take it to a mechanic because he didn't know what he was doing. So um, the story of the song felt so good and, and, and felt so right to us that we finished it. And it was based in the idea that I told him, I said, you know, I said, David, I went back home uh, not too long ago. And I walked through my old elementary school and I couldn't believe how small the halls were and how, how everything was so small. And I thought everything was so big back then when I was a kid, you know, it just seemed like massive. And so that was the idea is we were, we were talking about how things seem like when they're big, you know, when you're a kid or when you're younger, you know, you get older and you look at it from a different perspective and all of a sudden it's all different. And it, you know, to use more of a metaphor, things that that seem like they were large aren't really all that big at all you know they they if they seemed insurmountable they almost seem like they're too easy to overcome you know later on so that's where the song sort of sort of emulated from but the title was never right the chorus was never right until i was driving through texas one night and i stopped at this convenience store and it had a it had a big blue state of texas on it and the and the name of the store was called Biggs. And I remember always talking about people, people saying things are bigger in Texas. And I went, oh, my God, there it is right there. Big in Texas, bigger in Texas. So that just kind of rolled around in my head. And by the time I got to where I was going with my wife, I sat down and I wrote the chorus. And then I called David up about the week later and I said, you got to hear this. I sent it to him and he went, man, that's you're right. That's it. I didn't know it was broken, but it, it that's definitely it. So that's that's kind of how the song sort of got finished, so to speak, 25 years later. So and I tell people, you know, if you have something that you love, if it's a song, don't give up on it. You know, maybe it's just not the right time or maybe there's just that one little thing that just hasn't hit you yet. You know, it'll get there. Well, here it is. 25 years in the making. This is Big in Texas on Inside Farm Life. Mama called last Monday. So I packed my Sunday best. Drove back to my hometown to lay some things to rest. I 
As I pulled into the gravel drive, a thousand memories came alive. But somehow, our old house had changed. Like the old tree in our front yard, where Daddy used to work on cars, and the front porch where Mama liked to swing. Things ain't as big in Texas as they used to be when I left them. Looking back, I can see they were larger than life now to me. The shadows they cast were so tall. all that he believed So we didn't see eye to eye When I left home to chase my dreams We built a wall of foolish pride To prove who had the rider's side Some years we never even spoke but today the wall came tumbling down as we lay daddy in the ground. It's taken time and tears for me to know things ain't as big in Texas as they used to be when I left them. So, Randy, any special projects you've got on your bucket list or on the horizon that you can talk about? Well, I've never done this before, but I'm doing it this year. Uh, I've got a Christmas album that's going to be coming out uh, in uh, late October, early November. Uh, it's um, It's got a song uh, on there that I've covered for quite a few years and, and has gotten a lot of airplay on the different international stations and stuff. It's a, it's a version of Little Drummer Boy. Um and then I've got quite a few songs that a few songs that, that have been laying around for a while, you know, original songs. And then some some other songs I did. A, I've got a version of Silent Night that, that's on there that's kind of different. It's uh, I sang half of it in German and half of it in uh, in English because it's ri- originally was written um, in Austria. Um, so uh, it's it's and then there's a Roger Cook song on there called uh, All I Want for Christmas is Peace. Um, which is a great song. Roger's a great friend. Um, so uh, it's going to be an album that, that I never really wanted to do a Christmas album because there's been so many that's been done. And if you are like me and you listen to Bing Crosby's Christmas album, or you listen to Nat King Cole, you go, well, you can't do anything any better than that. Those are just some of the greatest Christmas records, greatest music ever recorded in the world that has to do with Christmas. And, um, 
but I came up with, with, with something that, that I felt right about doing. So, so I don't even know what the title of it's going to be yet, but it's going to be a Christmas album with my name on it, Randy C. Moore. So be looking for that. And then there'll be another album coming out next year sometime. Um, co-produced. Actually, there's two albums uh, in the can here. One of them will come out next year. It's um, a thing that I co-produced with my friend Norbert Putnam, who uh, was a guy who, uh, did a lot of records with Jimmy Buffett and Dan Fogelberg and different people like that. And he's a big legendary musician from Nashville and from Muscle Shoals. So um, I don't know when that's going to appear. That may appear sometime in March of next year, but definitely the Christmas album is going to hit last part of October, first part of November this year. And I would assume people can go to your website and be looking at that or follow. Yes. Social. Yep. The website, the www randy initial c more.com randy c more.com like's been running under the screen there you can find out where i'm playing and and what i'm playing and and how to get some of what i'm playing into your into your computer or or onto your cd player or or i've got flash drives now that i i sell of my album so you know, it's um, I've got stuff, um, but but mostly I'm just happy to to be able to go out and play and people enjoy what I'm doing because that's what that's what I was put here for to you know get give give people something they can enjoy with a little bit of music and maybe a few stories and something like that. You know, just something. Well, before we leave this week, we're going to give you one more from Randy C. Moore, the guy who left Nashville, Tennessee to go back to Texas. This is Going Back to Texas on Inside Farm Life. He hit the highway at 17. Those gold and elusive dreams. Looking back, the years have left him stone. He never liked it in Tennessee. Just another place to leave Just another reason to be gone And every day he talks about Going back to Texas Going back to Texas Going home And every night he dreams about Texas, packing up what's left of living, taking that good woman with him, back to Texas, back where he belongs. Folks at 55, glory bound the tears he cried, watched away the youth inside his soul. With his hands on the wrecking ball, he knocked down those prison walls, and nothing's gonna keep him from that road. talks about going back to Texas, going back to Texas, going home. And every night he dreams about going back to Texas, packing up what's left of living, taking that good woman with him back. Texas, back where he belongs. Tomorrow he will take her hand and lead her to a promised land. Underneath those big old Texas skies. Oh, every day he talks about going back to Texas. Texas going home and Every night he dreams about Going back to Texas Packing up what's left of living 
Taking that good woman with him Back to Texas Back where he belongs And eventually, life imitated art, huh? Yeah, it did. <laughs> I love how that worked out. It did. Folks who want to follow your career, randycmore.com. Also, go follow him on Facebook and wherever he's at on socials. Get out to those shows and and uh, go download some of that music. Appreciate you. Appreciate you having me on tonight, Brent. It's been, been fun. It's been a lot of fun. I wish you the best of luck, too, son. Well, I sure appreciate it, man. And, uh, you know, we want to thank you for, for taking the time to join us here on Inside Farm Life. And I'd love for you to come back anytime you want to share new music or just hang out. You know, I, I, I enjoyed this well enough to actually do it again without having my arm twisted. How about that? <laughs> Twist my arm. That's enough. <laughs> And we want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us this week. We invite you to subscribe to the Inside Farm Life podcast. You can find that at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, Deezer, Audible, and Odyssey. And we want to say a special thank you to our friends at Agco and their Massey Ferguson brand, the presenting sponsors of this week's show. Agco will be the presenting sponsor of all Inside Farm Life shows in the month of August, and I hope you go and check them out at the end of this month at the Farm Progress Show in Decatur, Illinois, where many of their fine products will be on display. Again, you can find them online at agcocorp.com, and you can find our Massey Ferguson friends at masseyferguson.com. We also want to say a special thank you to our additional sponsors, GoatLifeClothing.com, Concept Agritech, and Gateway Seed. Well, friends and neighbors, the clock on the wall tells us it's time to get on out of here. So for now, it's Brent Adams. Let's meet up here again next week, shall we? And hey, bring along a friend. You've been listening to Inside Farm Life, a production of Farm Life Media. If you have topic suggestions for future episodes, drop us a line at brent at farmlifemedia.com. And be sure to check out our website, farmlifemedia.com.